Wow, good morning. Here we are, flying by the seat of our pants. And <laughs> uh, we made it. And uh, thank you for making it too. And uh, we'll stall for time. People are probably reloading because it didn't work the first time. And so, good morning. This is uh, the day the Lord has made. And we intend to share His Word this morning and do some praying, do some thinking, do some. Uh, heart work uh, in committing to him and reviving our spirits and I intend to do some yielding some yielding some I like that yielding submitting <laughs> me too me too so uh, thank you for joining us this morning and and uh, we'll get uh, get on a roll here and and get into this and uh, I want to um, uh, just let you know that there's uh, two weeks until Christmas weekend uh, <laughs> I know that you already knew that. It just kind of dawned on me yesterday. <laughs> um, but um, I want to give you the Christmas schedule, the abbreviated Christmas schedule for uh, Zoe Church, our small community of faith. Uh, tomorrow night is ornament party uh, here Yay. for the women uh, in place of the women's uh, Monday group. So 7 o'clock. 7 p.m. and um, so um, please please look forward and be a part of that and then uh, in two weeks oh before that scatterbrain sorry uh, men's group will meet Tuesday for the last time this year uh, after after Tuesday night we will not meet till after the first of the year so in a couple of weeks after that so so uh, men and women this week, ornament party and meeting. And then uh, in, in two weeks on Christmas weekend, uh, we are going to have a special Christmas Eve observance at Pastor Dave and Lisa's home from 4 to 5 p.m. Mm -hmm. So that's on Friday night, Christmas Eve, 4 to 5 p.m., at Dave and Lisa's home, where we met in the summer for services. So uh, uh, if you're in town, please be a part of that and, uh, and, and show your connection to the community of faith by being there. And uh, we, will, um, we will bond with the Lord and, and uh, have a good Christmas Eve, but it, mm -hmm. but it, will, um, it will be um, uh, great for you to Observe that, and then there's still time left for the Christmas Eve festivities, whatever your family has planned. Okay, so, and then following uh, Christmas Day, the day after, uh, December 26th, we'll have our Sunday morning service at Pastor Dave and Lisa's home, as we did in the summer. And it'll start at 9.30 a.m., so um, look forward to that, please be a part of that. If you're in town, we will we will live stream that. For those of you who can't be there or are in other parts of uh, the country, the world, uh, so it'll be uh, live streamed at 9:30. And so that's what we've got planned uh, for the Christmas schedule. And uh, sorry for rushing through that so much, but hey, you can play this again uh, or play it again on YouTube if you want. So. Um, Okay, with all that said, I want to uh, ask Kathy if she wants to say anything about the ornament party and then open us with a prayer. Please come, women. Come to the ornament party at my house. It's, uh, if Text me if you need directions. But we want to see you, and even if you don't have an ornament, we would want to see you here. So please come because it's a great opportunity for us to meet together again in person. But for now, would you please join me in prayer because the Lord wants to hear us. Lord, that always tickles me on the one hand and seems like it can't be true when I say that you want to hear us, that it is so clear in your word is such a comfort that you've told us in different ways to be persistent, to keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking, and that you want to hear from us. And so, Lord, here we are your little flock of Zoe meeting uh, with others around the world who are meeting on the calling on the name of Jesus this morning and being joyful that it is this Christmas season Lord that you've given us this blessing 
to be able to enjoy another season. And Lord, um, most of us are fully aware that it isn't what a Hallmark movie or a fairy tale might say it is, but it's so much more because mm -hmm. it holds the promise of every good thing, every perfect thing. It holds the promise of, uh, of us being face to face with our Savior one day and for being totally whole. And Lord, I, I don't know. I just am so grateful for this time, even though it's been a hard couple of years with, with the pandemic and stuff. We just pray that you would be pleased to meet with us, that mm -hmm. you would give us what we need. Lord, I thank you for speaking to people. I thank you that uh, you spoke to me this week about taking my thoughts captive and thinking about them being like wild animals sometimes, just um, trying to escape and go all over the place and have to be corralled up. But Lord, your word is a really good place uh, for me to keep my mind and my thoughts and and to have uh, surrounding me. So I pray that for each and every one of us this morning, that we could uh, look to your word, learn your word, see what you're saying, and then take that and put it in our lives in places that will help us. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Kathy. And for those of you who just uh, tuned in, I noticed a bunch of you did while, while uh, we started the prayer. Uh, this Christmas schedule is going to be an ornament party tomorrow night and then Christmas Eve, 4 to 5 p.m. at Dave and Lisa's home where we met in the summer. And then Christmas Day plus one service, the 26th, 9.30 a.m. at Dave and Lisa's home. We will also live stream that service so you can catch it right here uh, as you've been doing on Sunday morning. Okay, so I have um, uh, several texts for you this morning and let me get in a place where I can uh, uh, digitally fire them up and, and be efficient with our time. So um, I'll read these for you. If you want to turn, you'll probably have time to turn as I turn, but um, first one is from uh, Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. This is the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. It began just as the prophet Isaiah had written, Look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you. He will prepare your way. He is a voice shouting in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. Then uh, if, you, if you turn to Matthew uh, chapter 1, verse 18, we have a text there. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, her, uh, Joseph, her fiancé, was a good man and did not want to disgrace her publicly. So he decided to break the engagement quietly. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son. And you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from, the, from their sins. All this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through, through the prophet, look, the virgin, will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son. They will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. And then um, back to Mark's gospel, chapter 7. And um, beginning in verse 20, these are the words of Jesus. And then he added, It is what comes from inside that defiles you. For from within, out of a person's heart, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, lustful desires, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these vile things come from within. They are what defile you. And then, uh, if you would turn with me over to John chapter 8. 
And we just have one verse there, verse 12. Jesus spoke to the people once more and said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. And then finally to Ephesians, uh, the end of, of chapter 4, I'm going to read a few verses in the interest of time here. You can read this whole section from verse 21 uh, through 517. But I'm just going to read a few verses. Uh, so beginning Ephesians chapter 4, verse 21 to 24. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. And then from chapter 5, uh, verse 8 through 10, For once you were full of darkness, but now you have the light from the Lord. So live as people of the light. For this light within you produces only what is good and right, and true. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. And then jump down to verse 15, where we read, So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Would you pray with me? So, Father, we've been focusing on light, the history of light in creation, the history of light and man's understanding. And now we see both the history of light from man's understanding and light as it spiritually progresses uh, into humanity once again after the fall of man. And I pray that you would give us eyes to see this, ears to hear this. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to have light within our soul, within our mind, in our mental thoughts. I pray we would utilize the light that you bring there and that it would affect us, Lord, that it would uh, change our life of living in shadows and darkness into making us children of the light. Thank you that you hold this promise out to every one of us who follow Jesus. It's not a matter of who's advanced the furthest or who's the brightest in any way, but those uh, promises that you've made to guide us, they're for everyone. And I pray that you'd help us understand the need, the, the necessity, and the help that you give us by lighting up our inside reality. And I pray this morning would go a long way into our first steps uh, forward, following you in a way that's lit up. In Jesus' name, amen. So in 1610, Galileo introduced a discovery that disturbed the world he operated in. The discovery was the four moons of Jupiter. What was disturbing the world is that the moons were orbiting around Jupiter and not the Earth. So Galileo got pushback. He got uh, tremendous pushback from theologians. Uh, Galileo was Catholic and, and actually a member of uh, the Catholic hierarchy of education, and he was accountable to the Vatican, and so he cared very much. He was Jesuit educated, and he cared very much about uh, his place and, and what happened there. And so when he got this pushback, he uh, immediately thought of another way to uh, get this out into uh, other minds to, uh, to, to know what to do about it and what it meant. And so what he did was he, he created some nice telescopes. He made them himself. He used the best optics. He used his own technology, which he knew how to do. And he gave several telescopes to rich and powerful people throughout the different countries, which he knew of. And so his hope was obviously that, that uh, they could help him break through the barriers that were uh, preventing people from understanding uh, light, understanding what was happening uh, uh, in the universe around. Because the medieval mind up until that point 
saw the whole creation as a system of analogies that were intended to teach humankind how to live and how to know God. So most of the arguments about the reality around us were based on analogies, uh, uh, ways of examining oneself or expressing oneself. And, and, uh, and, and so they were all meant to, to give us knowledge into uh, the world around us through analogy. And so when you disturbed any of those analogies, you disturbed the whole system of, of thinking about creation. And of course, you know, you'd have to uh, stop the, um, uh, the broadcast here and think this through, but this is really self-serving. So you have all these analogies that you think describes reality. And then those analogies are based on God and his nature. They're based on um, what you know out of scripture and what's been revealed as truth. And so then you point those analogies back to God and truth, and you think you've created a great circle that everyone will see and praise God for. Okay, the problem with that has always been that the creation around us has analogies uh, to God, to be sure, but God has no analogies to the creation. You can't, you can't make up, uh, you, you can't take something from God's nature, revealed truth, for example, that the Son uh, uh, is the effulgent glory of the Father and always uh, emanates from the Father. You can't take that and say, well, now I can understand light because of that. It doesn't work the other way around. The analogies don't go backwards. And what, what we found out from the history of studying light uh, is, is uh, well, actually, this part of the introduction, so that's the next part of the story. So, um, Galileo uh, disperses these telescopes, and one rich man in Prague looks through the telescope, sees the moons of Jupiter, and says, I don't know what to make of this. <laughs> this doesn't mean much to me. And, uh, and so um, he, he has a friend, uh, Johannes Kepler, in town, who he knows is an observationist, who is a scientist, and, and, uh, and he, he calls on Kepler to come and take his telescope for 10 days and, and use it and then come back and tell him what to make of this information. Okay, so Kepler was raised in a Lutheran home. He was, he was raised in a home that, um, that wasn't under the control of the um, thought process of the day. And, and, and because of that, Kepler could look at this and say, this is, this is very startling. Observing this from day to day over a period of a week has shown me that, um, that clearly these moons are orbiting around Jupiter. They're not orbiting around the Earth. And, and so this idea of a, an Earth-centered universe, uh, though it is, it is um, appealing to many, it's just not true. Uh, so Kepler got really excited. Now, Kepler was very, very nearsighted, like me. <laughs> and um, one of the things I discovered early on in looking through telescopes and in looking through binoculars is that you can correct your vision with them. You look through a telescope and you can be as blind as a bat. And by focusing the light through the lens, you can see clearly. And it's quite an aha experience for you. Well, it, it, Kepler had that experience. And what it did is it triggered in him uh, just this tremendous uh, questioning of thought. How does this work? How is this doing this? And so within a week's time, he had written a book called Dioptris. And, uh, and, and that book explored how lenses work. And it set the stage for an extremely important discovery later, um, um, not too long later. Um, but he understood that, that now a lens takes and focuses the light and creates another image inside of the mind that the mind is able to map onto the outside world. And so a lot of principles of mathematics as far as focal length and lens size and lens perfections could be calculated. And in this work, he, um, he understood, he began to understand how telescopes and how lenses more particularly work. Now, what, what Kepler did that astounded and changed our understanding of the outside world is 
He cleared out all of the constellations and universe out of his mind's eye and on paper, and he only put the planets and the sun on these elliptical orbits. And he decided to create mathematics based on planetary motion. And so he eliminated all the confusion because it's really hard to look through a telescope and see, for example, constellations move and stars move with the shifting of not only uh, the earth around the sun, but the sun traveling through the universe. And so if you're trying to recreate the vis vision of reality based on mathematics that matches those lights, it's just hopelessly confusing. But Kepler uh, understood that if he created the right model for the planetary motion, then he could apply sophisticated mathematics to it and begin to predict and test whether he actually had the right model or not. And so this became uh, the groundwork for, uh, for how the next transition in, uh, in, in history went. So uh, not too long after that, within, within uh, two decades, Galileo went on trial for suspicion of heresy at the Inquisition. And the specific charge was that he was uh, advocating that the earth moved and that it orbited around the sun. And so what they did at the Inquisition is they showed him instruments of torture and they told him he was going to be tortured. And so he recanted of that view and he went back to Florence and he lived the rest of his life uh, in, in relatively uh, peaceful conditions, but under house arrest so that they would make sure he would never uh, tell anyone else again about that. Just a postscript to that story. Uh, on October 31st, 1992, Pope John Paul II said that the church was wrong to condemn Galileo for holding that the earth is not the center of the universe. And furthermore, theologians should not think that the literal sense of scripture explains the physical world. So Galileo off the hook then uh, 300 plus years uh, later. So, but, but back to the, the story. So Descartes comes along and he uses the, um, uh, the observations that Kepler had, the, uh, the understandings that Kepler was developing, and he, uh, he begins to uh, uh, create an understanding of how our, how our minds work. And you know the famous uh, statement of cog cogito ergo sum, I think therefore I am, <clears throat> was Descartes' expression of the fact that my inward uh, reality is, is a reality. My thinking is a separate reality. And so he realized that, that in my mental constructions, uh, I base my view of reality based on perceptions of sight and sound and touch and taste and smell, rather than I'm, I'm really participating in the, the forms uh, the world's forms, as Plato would say. So our mind, the part of us that reason, looks out on all the rest. Our body, our society, on the physical world. Truth doesn't enter our, our mind from the outside. Rather, our minds construct truth from what it observes and what it deduces. And so that, that shift, that understanding that we have an inner reality, we have an inner reality in which we perceive outward truth, and, but what we make up and what we uh, think is true inside of us then filters and, and alters how we perceive truth. It goes all the way back to Aristotle talking about uh, his famous quote, in inventing a model, we may assume what we wish but we should avoid impossibilities. So we create these models in our mind uh, and, and then we avoid impossibilities because they'll tear the model apart, but then we take all the leeway in the world to create these models. So you can see that our thinking can be very precarious. Um, just an aside here, uh, evangelicalism over the last several decades is pretty much just an analogy based, almost a bumper sticker depth uh, reasoning of one thing is assumed and another thing is assumed and it just put things together and you have all these pithy sayings and slogans and 
And uh, it's pretty much, they're pretty much based on analogy. Well, this is like that, and hey, look at this, and, and, and it'll make you think of that. And, uh, and, and just really lacking the depth, the depth that, uh, that's needed for reality. And here's, a, here's point number one that I make to you today in our transition. Reality around us, the created world around us and in us, is much more complicated than any analogy will help you unravel. You may have an analogy that gives you peace of mind for a day or two, or maybe even a squandered lifetime, but life is, is complicated and the world around us is complicated. Maybe you can see God in, from the world around us, but it's probably a lot more complicated than you ever imagined. And I present to you the evidence of what light is and how it's uh, unfolded through history, the understanding of light. So let's, uh, let's get now to uh, the exciting part of this, and that is what the scriptures say about our inside world. So the, the first uh, scripture that we read, the uh, Mark scripture, is the prophecy of, of Jesus coming, of John the Baptist coming. Uh, I like the way uh, the, the, the prophecy is quoted uh, to prepare your road, uh, that, that you is ambiguous there. Think of yourself as having a road, having a way of life. But, um, but Jesus needed uh, the road prepared for him. And the Matthew scripture is awesome because it just says clean out the road, clear it out. And um, uh, so um, that is an awesome uh, thing to think about, that, that Jesus comes with a, with a whole new um, uh, uh, project. You know, most construction projects, building roads, you just level and flatten what's there. You know, roads uh, don't easily adapt to other roads. And, and God's new way of living doesn't necessarily adapt to the old ways. The old ways are, are um, stifling. The, the, uh, the differences between classes and society and power and people get so great that they need to be leveled out. They need to be flattened out. That's kind of what, what John the Baptist did. You know, he looked to the righteous Pharisees and he said, why are you coming out here to be baptized? Go back and, and repent, you brood of vipers. You're powerful, rich people, but you're not walking with the Lord. And so he kind of leveled the road out to where everybody was on this road of, well, the Messiah's coming and he's going to speak the words that we need to hear. And, and uh, don't look back to tradition to find uh, the ways uh, in which to go forward with God, but look to the Messiah. He'll show us. He'll tell us. And so then we find in the Matthew passage that, that Jesus was conceived by the Father in heaven and Mary uh, and, and his uh, uh, earthly father was an adoptive father and it was Joseph and Joseph uh, sought to do right by Mary, sought to dismiss her. He, he, thought, he sought to do something that was morally right and he only had within his capacity the ability to say what is legally best here to do. And so Joseph at that point is a moralist. He, he wants to morally do what is right. But the direction that he needed to take was not brought to him by moral reasoning. It took light. And in this case, it took light from heaven. An angel had to come and say, well, this is what happened, Joseph. And so what you're to do is to take uh, this child as your own and name him Jesus and he shall be called God is with us. And with that illumination, uh, Joseph then proceeded and the Christ child came into the world. And so Christmas is about uh, our way of life, God with us, and it's a new way. It's a brand new way. It steps out from under uh, whatever we learned in our, in our ways before we knew the Lord and it, and, it, and it basically plods new ground. It gains new ground in life. So the way in which you live then is the way of life. And, uh, and then we go to the Mark passage. And the Mark passage is really, uh, uh, really 
important here uh, because it shows us that without Christ, that what's inside of us is not really so simple. Uh, in fact, it's so complex that it's scary. And so Jesus said, what comes from inside of us defiles us. And he names 13 things there. Now, these 13 things are actions, but he says they come out of us. So, um, so it's not our behavior that starts our, our demise in this world. It's actually what's in us. And, you know, these things are within a person's heart. Evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, and the list goes on and on and on. And the, the, the vile things come from within and then they are acted out into this life and they become actions. They become the evil. They become what's, what's dark, what's not good, what, what comes out of the depths of the darkness of a fallen human existence. And, and so that's what is the revelation to our soul that we need to understand that that, yeah, you can see there is a goodness in humanity. When humans work together and the grace of God finds us, that good things happen in humanity. But within any one of us is the capability of, of such evil to plunge us into uh, just darkness galore. I think most of us have that understanding. For some of us, it's what drives us to seek out the Lord is that understanding of how dark sometimes we can get, how dark our, our thoughts were. Uh, but then the promise of the gospel is held out to us, and that's where we go to the John uh, passage in, in uh, John 8, 12, where Jesus says to, to the people, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. And actually, he says, you won't have to walk in darkness. So if you don't have this light, you have to walk in darkness. Do you understand that? If your thoughts are, are evil, if they have darkness in them, if they are wicked, and that's what comes out of your heart, if they are fallen thoughts, you have to walk in darkness. Now, you may have tremendously strict upbringing. You may have behaviors guided and, and, uh, and, and, and pushed to a certain uh, uh, form so that it, you look like a civilized person who, who is good for humanity and good for yourself. You may look like that, but you have to walk in darkness. Your day-by-day -day walk, the things you do in life, they have to be dark because that's all you have. That's what's inside of you. And so Jesus said, if you follow me, you will have the light that leads to life. So here it is, inside of our thoughts, inside of our hearts, inside of our, who we are, inside of the engine of our activities, which is our thoughts and intents and attitudes in our heart, Jesus gives us the light of life because he leads us, okay? So this is the astounding thing about the light that I want to talk about this morning. I'm, I'm calling this uh, the light from heaven, street lights. Street lights illuminate the way you're, you're going. Street lights don't illuminate everything. They don't give you a comprehensive knowledge of the theory of everything. They, they do illuminate for you your thoughts. Hey, what am I thinking about? Is this, is this uh, something I could develop? Uh, I would imagine that Kepler thinking about how to take these, this reality of these four moons orbiting around Jupiter and turn it into something that others could help him understand. I would imagine him uh, understanding and thinking this through that he needed first to uh, develop an understanding of lenses so that that telescope lens uh, could, could be completely understood down to the, the smallest form of measurement so that when they went to apply science to any theories, they would have an accurately measuring instrument. And so from his mind, he thought through that. And what, what lit up to him is, I need to get in writing 
uh, what I don't even understand yet, and that's how these lenses work. And so he sought to understand it. And he was led each step along the way. Now, you don't know that he didn't pray. Okay, Kepler's not a story of, of, of faith that's going to be found in any book. But this man uh, was raised in a Lutheran home. And I'm kind of thinking, this guy's probably praying, uh, Lord, how can I, what, what's happening with this lens or whatever? But you don't have to accept that. You can uh, think of him as a total retro, reprobate if you want. But I'm using this as an example. So he needs to know what the next step is and how to go forward with his life and light helps him move forward. That light doesn't help you and I. Uh, if I look at the uh, inversion of a lens uh, and the light formulas of, of refraction and, and all of that stuff, I can, I can barely read it. I don't understand it completely. I couldn't calculate for you the difference of the speed of light through air than water or glass. I certainly couldn't tell you the refraction angle, the angle of incidence, and all the things that are required that came out of one week with a telescope for Kepler. Uh, but, uh, but nevertheless, they were important discoveries, and they led to this change in the understanding of reality around us. And so um, what we learn about how to walk through this life is, number one, that we need internal illumination. We need the things that we think about, the things that we intend, the things that we're gonna do. We need to be illuminated. We need light shed on that. That's what Jesus came to do. But we also need to understand that what goes on inside of us is not reality outside of us. It is, it is not, uh, it is not true that you can just men mind your own business and take care of your own mental existence and be okay mentally and live a life that's full of goodness. You'll just live a life of, of self-servingness. So somehow, whatever goodness is conceived, hatched inside of you needs to come out into actions, out into the world around you. And all the way along, you need to be lit up so you don't stumble and fall. You need light on how to walk with the Lord. You need to follow Jesus and let that light come inside. So um, I think the thing comes together in Ephesians, in the Ephesians passage. And uh, we, we find there in, uh, uh, in chapter 4, uh, verse 21, so you hear about Jesus and you learn the truth that comes from him. Throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life. So any of those 13 things in, in Mark chapter 7 that you were drawn to, uh, you know, down from murders and, and whatever, all the way down to uh, lustful and selfish thoughts, throw off all of those because they're corrupted by deception and lust the fall of humankind, and instead let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. That's the light that's brought in you because Christ has come. That's the, the Christmas light inside of you. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. And then there are examples of, of the uh, negative all through here, which I, which I skipped, not because we want to skip the negative, but because you can read those on your own. But verse 8 summarizes of chapter 5, Ephesians. For once you were full of darkness, but now you have the light from the Lord. So this is the light from the Lord. These are the street lights inside of you. Live as people of light. For this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. And, uh, and, then, and then wrapping it up in verse 15 through 17. Be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. So... There are some principles here about learning how to live with streetlights, okay? Streetlights are a different, uh, different view of, of lighting than we want to think of. 
Uh, we want to think of light as bathing all of our existence and all of our knowledge so that we have perfect and full knowledge and capability. Street lights just give you how to walk the next few steps. What's in the way, what will stumble you, where to go. But also, street lights can help you uh, develop thoughts that, that, are, that are able to be flowering into good things. So um, our way through life is the road. The street lights illumine. What do they illumine? Okay, they illumine intentions, methods, outcomes. So, um, so you have an idea inside of you, you have a thought, you think it's a good thought, and street lights illuminate that. The Lord will show you the nature of those thoughts. Now, here's, a, here's the subtlety of today's message. If you haven't uh, tuned out already, if you, if you think you already get this, uh, you probably won't get this next point. God lights up our way through life with street lights, not through a voice telling us, but through light lighting up how we're doing things, how we're walking. There's a subtle difference. Uh, I can try to do something that, the, that is a good intention. It's not from my uh, evil twin self, <laughs> the, the old man that's, a, that's attached to my new spirit. Uh, the, the origins of, of a thought may come from the Lord and maybe uh, may come from my born-again self. And as I think about it and as I, and as I illuminate um, those thoughts, as I reason through it, Light comes down and shows me the wisdom of it. God doesn't say, he doesn't stamp approved, disapproved, evil, good. But I'll be thinking through something, Lord, I, I want to do this. Is this a good thing? And suddenly I'll see, well, this is, this is not only a good thing, but this is also going to flow from it. This is going to be an outcome. This is going to be how you can do it. This is going to add and enhance what you're doing. That's what light is. Light expands and open up, opens up the world around you so that you do what you're going to do better when what you want to do is part of the way of life that God is calling you to. That's why we need light. We need light to, ex to expand and do things right. So let me say this also about street lights. Street lights light the way. They don't light the road to destruction. So if you're on the road to destruction and you're thinking that you need some street lights here to help you take the next step, you're not going to find it lit up. It's not going to, you're not going to have any help that way. You're not going to know what to do next. If you're on the road, uh, if you're on the broad road, the road that leads to destruction, there's one solution for that. It's not street lights. It's the light of the world. <laughs> You need the Jesus who will go out over the many hills and find the one lost sheep, you, and carry you back to the, the, the flock, the, shep, the, the, the sheep of God, and put you on the road of life. Then he'll bring the street lights in. He doesn't bring the street lights into your darkness if you're so far in darkness you can't see the way of life. And that's a hope this morning. And this morning, if you're feeling like I haven't seen light in months, I haven't seen light in years, I live such a dark existence, I'm so smothered by that dark existence that I'm beginning to be hopeless. If that's you this morning, just call on Jesus. Just ask him to come into your life. Ask him to step into your heart, to step into your internal existence. The Spirit of God will bring him personally into your existence. He will bring light into your soul, light that will show you the way that God wants you to, to walk, to live. Then he'll illuminate later with street lights how you, how you live today and how you live tomorrow and how you live the next day and how you make more efficient use of your time and energy and resources and prayers and existence with him. So he lights the way. He doesn't light the dark roads. He doesn't light the dark places with street lights. So let me give you um, a, a subtle nuance of this. It's been easy for me a lot in ministry to understand 
how God is lighting certain parts of where I would take sermons, how I would teach, transitions, conclusions, um, seasonal studies. I have a lot of confidence that if I pray and I wait on the Lord, He will show me what to do. And for some reason, I don't have that confidence about day-to-day -day life. I've only just been discovering that if I'm doing something that pleases the Lord, there's all kinds of light around in my thinking. I can think of how to do it better. I can think about how to make it work right. I can think about how to make it long lasting. I can think about how to take what I'm working on and make it have better outcomes. And there's nothing less than streetlights lighting the way to the road I'm on right now. And I've underestimated God's ability to illuminate uh, parts of life and make life not only easier, but more efficient, better for others around me, and, and in a way to, to, to keep me away from the darkness that would, would overtake whatever light there was and, and just make me a child of light in more of a, uh, in more of a classic way. And so I want to uh, commend with you this morning to, to understand that, that God in Christmas brings the light right inside of us, right to the place where Jesus knows we need light the most. We can take any thoughts, any intentions, anything we're about to act on, and we can allow light from Jesus brought to us by the Holy Spirit to examine that to show us the goodness of that or the evil of that. Not, and I'm not talking about a voice in our head. I'm talking about just look at what you're thinking of doing. Just look at what you intend to do. Look at what the outcome's going to be. I don't believe in spontaneity. I don't think Jesus teaches spontaneity. Things we do come out of our heart. They come out of our intentions. Now, we may not be conscious of those things, but but they come forth because of who we are and who we've become. And so as we let the light of the streetlights and our way of life shine on us, we can discover not only things we shouldn't do, but that the things that we do can get divine help. The actions that we're going to have in our life can go from actions that are just uh, okay to things that are good, things that are done right, things that are done well, things that bless others, and even things that glorify God. Would you pray with me? So, Father, another um, uh, challenging message about light, how much we need light to walk day by day, and how uh, in the wrong places we can find what poses for light, but is not really illuminating our interior mental space in the way that Jesus does. I pray that you would give us this light. I pray we would not be deceived and, and think that this inward light is all we need. We definitely, uh, we definitely need reality around us. It's the check. It's the ultimate understanding that the light that was in us was real and from you is that it affects uh, reality the way we thought it would and the way you said it would. And so guard us, but guide us, Lord. Make the guiding light of Christmas our light day by day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now I pray that you would have moments this week where you're trying to do something, but you're relaxed, where you will see how to do it better. It won't cost you more time, may even be more efficient, but it will result in you understanding that your very thoughts are illuminated by Jesus Christ through the Spirit of God in His name. Amen.